does the feeling of responsibility to what I see as my outer world transform to knowing that the connection made properly is always doing what the playwright wants to be done. I do believe so, but I wonder where the doubt is from. And then she goes on, and we've been conditioned to, quote, if it sounds too good to be true, then it is, which would be true in the outer world of selfish desire, but is not is it not is it not true in the inner world of unselfish desire okay so there are several questions here but the questions come from the ego level because only the ego has an outer world and uh, and an inner world and it's that split mind that is the problem uh, and so one does not have a responsibility to the outer world. One has a responsibility to the real self, which heals, heals the split within the consciousness that separates the inner from the outer. And it's when you fulfill that responsibility, one becomes, in the Buddhist tradition, a bodhisattva, or one becomes Christed, uh, one, or one becomes an avadutta, but one is uh, then able to be of service, but without any belief that one is serving anything other than the self, because no other uh, even exists. And then the, the next question really is, uh, is the, uh, the belief that there is such a thing as unselfish desire. And uh, desire has to always be uh, uh, that of a, uh, an apparent entity because desire arises in the mind uh, and in the uh, emotions, but this is part of the mind. And uh, is an intention uh, of one being to uh, uh, do something, even if it's for the sake of, of, uh, of another, it's within the illusory paradigm that there actually is an other. And so again, when the, uh, the truth is realized, there is no desire. There is love and there is service out of love. But there is no projection that the other needs to be rescued because the other is also the self. And the, no, no manifestation of the self needs rescue. But love can help to awaken uh, a being to that truth. But, there is, but whatever is to unfold happens through the will of uh, of the soul intelligence who determines it all. And it's only the will of God, which is also not uh, God's desire, but simply the unfoldment of that, that supreme intelligence that produces truth and beauty, but without desire. So uh, that word becomes uh, an obsolete uh, imaginary uh, belief. Okay. <clears throat> Next uh, question from Vajra. We didn't understand, we, okay, I don't know who you're with, but all right, we didn't understand what the soul, S-O-L-E, part of shifting from soul to soul, if you remember at phase two of the journey, what does it mean that soul intelligence, and here she writes S-O-U-L, is the self of every soul. That's not what I, I meant, it's the other soul. The, the, the soul intelligence, meaning the only intelligence, the intelligence of the absolute, that is the self of every soul. So it's not, uh, 
it's not a soul a, a soul level uh, intelligence that we're talking about, but the ultimate absolute uh, self. And then it goes on, how is this related to the buddhi, and how does one use this intelligence to go beyond the soul's penchant for reincarnation? Okay. One does not use this intelligence. This intelligence will use your buddhi. Okay. You're, that's the, the whole point of realizing that yourself is the absolute God self, is that then thy will be done, no longer mine, and the buddhi discerns uh, in its awakened state as a Buddha that it is the, uh, the intelligence of God that must move uh, its uh, subtle and gross vehicles in its uh, in the remaining period of the uh, of Chronos time, but the soul's penchant for reincarnation, once you have connected at that level, completely disappears because there will be no further reincarnations in this cycle. That's it. You know, a few babies you know may be born but won't grow up, but. There's no more uh, reincarnation, no future lives in this cycle. Uh, th this is the final chance to attain uh, your, your true nature. And that will be uh, what is understood by the Bodhi. And so uh, the Bodhi will open to the truth that its own intellect can only complete the journey by being absorbed back into the absolute self. And uh, the soul illusion disappears along with that. So not only is there no penchant for reincarnation, but no longer a belief that there was ever an incarnation in the first place. Okay, next question. When does the dreaming of the new world take place and will the new world emerge with the death of Kali Yuga simultaneously? Okay, that's an interesting question. Uh, and it's kind of a yes and no. Why? Because at the omega point, when uh, the ultimate cosmic annihilation takes place, that is the end of time, as well as the end of space. And so you are now in a situation where you can't say how long a gap is it between the end and the next beginning, because there is no time. You're in eternity. And you can't say, well, how long have I been in eternity? There's no one there with a clock to measure that. So everything ends completely, but there's no one there to say, ah, it's ended completely, and now I'm going to redream the new. No. Out of eternity, the new dream emerges, and suddenly you are, if you are in that, you are a being in time. If you have, if you have the, the good fortune of... Uh, of manifesting in the Sat Yuga as it emerges out of eternity and the new cycle begins. You may come later on and still suddenly you're in time and uh, uh, it didn't matter how many thousands of years since your last incarnation, it's just like that because you have been in suspended animation in the eternal level of the light. So. There is, no, there is no sense of time. It's only in the between lives state where there are uh, bardos and, uh, and moments of being taught by spiritual guides uh, in the uh, intermediary uh, range 
uh, from uh, one life to another be, when one does not go fully into the light, that there is a, a sense of a between life period, but not otherwise, not at the, between the end and the beginning. Okay, so I hope that answers that. As the Kali Yuga proceeds, how do I avoid being upset by the next corrupt thing that the politicians and warmongers and the elite are trying to perpetrate on the world? Well, you realize that all of these perpetrators are serving God because they can't do anything else. They have no free will. They are like the bacteria that eat away at decomposing corpses. The world is, a, is now a, a corpse. It's, it's the walking dead. And, and these forces are, are removing the suffering of uh, the cells that still remain in this, uh, this dying uh, uh, protoplasm. And, uh, and they are serving to speed up the, uh, the end, so suffering ends as quickly and mercifully as possible. And so uh, why, why oppose them or, or, or uh, attack them in your mind? Because if you do, you're falling to the same level of violence and, uh, uh, because anger is a form of violence. And uh, one must have uh, perfect love, as Christ said in his refusal to uh, attack those who were crucifying him. And so there has to be a, a complete recognition that all is perfect. There are no uh, actual dark forces uh, a, a, except secretly in the service of the light. Even though those forces themselves are, are generally not aware of that fact. Can you offer any words on building and maintaining a skillful practice while transitioning out of spiritual bypassing? I had a burning moment in meditation that made me afraid to go any further. But I've learned of building merit and wisdom. I feel more light of heart knowing the truth of service but my mimetic desires still tend to cascade potholes into karmic 13 car pile-ups. <laughs> well, uh, again, I would refer you to uh, Ramana and uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj and uh, recognize uh, that uh, the fear that you are uh, experiencing when in meditation you begin to, uh, your mind or your consciousness opens up to the infinite is the fear of ego death. And the only way past that is to, is to be willing to make a voluntary sacrifice knowing that that is the commandment of God. No matter what religion you might feel like you, are, uh, you belong to, if that's the case, uh, the commandments are there. Love God with all your heart, your soul, your might, and, uh, and, and sacrifice all uh, to God. And uh, your job is to bring your consciousness back to God. And your consciousness includes the world that you are projecting as if it's outside your consciousness. So you are bringing that whole suffering world uh, and all of its uh, karmic pile-ups back into the perfection of God's uh, realm of light and love. And so uh, through that surrender, all of this will be resolved uh, spontaneously. Mm -hmm. 
Is the angel of death an entity or a metaphor for the death of the world? It's neither one. It's the force of the collective death drive because every ego has embedded within it uh, a death drive. This was the, one of, I think, probably Freud's greatest discovery back, I think, around 1920 uh, when he wrote uh, Beyond the Pleasure Principle after seeing he, his, uh, his form of psychoanalysis couldn't cure anyone and, uh, and that they weren't really motivated by pleasure. And he couldn't understand uh, why people were holding on to past traumas and holding on to past grudges and holding on to uh, uh, habit patterns of jouissance that produce suffering, why they would produce nightmares at night and not be able to sleep and have all of these issues. These are deliberate uh, uh, symptoms of a desire to suffer and uh, ultimately to die, to want to die. And, uh, and when this torment becomes great enough, one becomes suicidal, literally. Uh, or, and, and one can commit suicide by, uh, by drugs, by cop, by uh, joining an army as a mercenary, by any, any of many different ways. Uh, but uh, one finds a way uh, to, uh, to suicide. And there's a collective urge to get out of this. And at the ego level, there isn't an awareness that this death drive uh, that uh, Freud discovered actually has a, a, a bifurcation. There's also an upper death drive, not just the lower one. And the upper death drive is to go through ego death, not to kill the body but to kill the suffering uh, mind that's an illusion. And, uh, and so if one has the, uh, the faith and the uh, good fortune and the clarity of mind to recognize that there must be a higher power to appeal to, then prayer and devotion will replace the lower death drive and uh, the yearning for uh, salvation will, will uh, bring one into the soul and one will then function with love and wisdom and reach the, uh, the goal uh, and be free of that. But uh, the angel of death represents this collective drive to bring about uh, the ultimate holocaust uh, and uh, get it over with because the suffering is just too, uh, too intense and, and too bad to, uh, to want to be in, and the world uh, is not worth uh, existing. The nihilism in the current level of consciousness has, uh, has taken over most minds so that there, there is no love of the world and uh, only a sense that it's all corrupt and perverted and, uh, and deserves... Uh, not to exist. Okay. I discovered in my last Atmanology session that my attachment to being wiped out, or I assume this means being stung in my hara, was not coming from outside, but is my own rejection of the self. While realizing this, I felt the space of unconditional love but for a very short period, but it was a moment of bliss from a life of self-torment. And now it seems that my resistance against remembering the zero point is accelerating, and uh, including it leading to symptoms like forgetting that this retreat was happening. Uh, and uh, with the short time that is left, uh, and since I don't live in an ashram and I have deep resisting uh, patterns, I long for a shortcut to bliss in any circumstance. I think everyone does. Uh, 
I think the shortcut is what, uh, again, Nassar Gadatta just uh, really said. Investigate the mind carefully and you'll discover it doesn't exist. The thoughts will stop and you will realize there is presence, but that presence is, is not any longer bifurcated into inner or outer. Uh, and uh, there will be an awareness of that energy that once the mind has a, a si become silence, will no longer create fear as the infinite expanse of energy, of light, of presence, uh, opens up and fills the emptiness. But you have to go through the kenosis, as the Christians call it, the self-emptying of mind, of mental patterns, of thinking and, and of resistance uh, through that, uh, that, that investigation and or the voluntary sacrifice and the devotion to, to God and to love. So if you do that, then the, uh, the sense of bliss being something that is different from what you are will also disappear because it's a belief. And once the mind that believes that it is not in bliss dissipates, the bliss is what remains and what has always been. There has never been anything but sat ananda the real of pure luminous presence, the supreme intelligence, and the blissful love. That's it. There's nothing else that constitutes reality. That's the trinity. And uh, so there's no, uh, there's no separation that needs to be overcome. That was the illusion of the ego that uh, enabled it to maintain a space, a bubble, as we've often said, in the ocean of consciousness. And once the bubble is popped, you see, there was never any separate entity. There was always just the ocean. And that's all, we, all that there is, is the ocean of bliss. So. Let's all just pop the bubbles and be free and enjoy the bliss now. Mm -hmm.